Yeah, can we give it up for our graduates this morning? So awesome. My favorite one is definitely Mariah Rogel with that dead goose. What a Rogel. I love it. Hey, uh, welcome to uh, church this morning. My name is Josh. I get the honor of being the youth pastor here at MRCC. Uh, thank you for joining us on this nice, super wonderfully rainy summerish day. Pastor Greg thinks summer will start next year. I think that is accurate. But hey, I'm excited. Um, every time I get the microphone for Sunday, I'm excited. So I might not give it back to Greg, but that's okay. Uh, but hey, it's just some really cool things happening at youth. And can I just say, man, you guys have some awesome students. I'm honored. We've just had such an awesome time in our youth ministry the last year. We've had some momentum. It's been crazy. Man, God has been working. God has been moving. Uh, students have been saying yes to Jesus. And I just think, man, Woo, I'm excited because I just want to see a move of God in Enumclaw, in King County, in Washington, in the world. And I think it could start right here in Enumclaw. I think that would be nuts. It would be awesome. And so we're believing for big, amazing, great things. Your students are awesome. I'm honored. Um, going along with that, hey, we have something cool coming up in about six weeks, and that's summer camp. Um, if you have a student that would um, like to come along, it's going to be super fun. It's going to be super warm because it's the end of July. We'll be over in Medical Lake, Washington. Uh, get your students signed up. Um, if you need some financial assistant, that's okay. Come talk to me. Uh, but don't let your student miss this opportunity. There's just something special about when we say, hey, God, I'm just going to step away from my normal comfort, and I'm going to put you first. And watching God move, he always does. Uh, I remember I got filled with the Holy Spirit at camp. I remember some of my biggest connections, big God moments growing up have been at camp. So get your student to camp. I love it. It's going to be amazing. Woo! I'm excited. All right, cool. I'm excited. It's cool. Uh, but not only that, like I said, we've had some just huge wins um, this year um, in our youth ministry and students saying yes to Jesus. It's big. Uh, we had a cool moment with our seniors uh, a few weeks ago where our seniors got to share some of their testimonies from youth. And the cool part about some of our seniors this year is they've come up from grade school all the way up. So we get to kind of hear kind of a perspective of a student that's been raised up by MRCC. So these are our people. These are our students as we send them out. Some of them are going to NU. Um, some of them are going into ministry. There's just a big call in these students' lives, and I'm excited for where God is taking them. And I'm just honored that we got to be a part of their journey. So we have this video of them sharing their student testimonies. If you back, go ahead and watch. I got the opportunity to start interning here, which has been with... Allison, sorry, I'll talk into the mic with Allison. Um, and that's just been an incredible opportunity. I am beyond grateful, even though there's days where I'm like, ah, ah, I don't want to, I'm just so tired, I don't want to go to work. It always, <laughs> it always ends up being an amazing time. I've learned so much um, about myself um, and about God that I wouldn't have been able to learn without being an intern here. I so 1 Corinthians 10 through 30, or 1031 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. No matter what, God is with you and do it for the glory of God and for his name and continue praising and loving him through that journey. God wants to be with you through that journey and he wants to help you and guide you through whatever you're doing. Um, if 12-year-old me was here right now, first of all, she would not be sitting in the front row. She'd be in the back hiding, um, but she would be in shock of where I am now and so am I. Um, I never really had a relationship with God before I came to culture. It, it was no more than just reading bedtime Bible stories or, you know, going to church on Sundays. I never knew God on a personal level. Like hearing the messages and when we would do altar calls and stuff like that, it really got me to start building a relationship with God and starting to realize what a fatherly love with God is like. Going forward, if you don't know where you're going in life, I think you should stop and pray about it and really take the time to listen to God in moments like worship or when somebody's speaking and really just cry out to God and be like, what is my calling? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to speak to? It wasn't until COVID hit that isolation started to get the best of me, and I was home all day alone, and I got sucked into substance abuse and addiction and everything like that. And um, I came to my mom, and I told her, you know, I want to get put into recovery and counseling and everything like that. I started um, coming every week, and I went up to Josh, and I said, hey, Josh, I want to get connected. 
I'm a photographer, that's what I do. And he said, great, next week, bring your camera, you're set. And so I started doing that and I fell in love instantly, not even just with doing what I love, but with the people here and the friendships that I've made and um, the community that I've just like kind of grown into and everything. And um, I'm now uh, like a year and four months sober, so. <laughs> Is it worth it to lose old friends to gain a community that brings you closer to God, to who God wants you to be? That's it. As I was sort of prepping for this message, um, I had just a couple verses, and I'm going to read them really quickly and sort of get into it. So my first one is 1 Corinthians 15:33, which says, "Do not be misled. Bad company comes good character, or corrupts good character. Doesn't bring good character." Um, so again, it just goes back to that show me your friends, show me your future when you're surrounding yourself with people who um, are making poor decisions and um, who are influencing poor decisions. Um, the chances of you being able to turn away from those are really difficult. You need people who, when you are at your lowest, regardless of what's happening, that they're going to come be there with you. And you need to be those people who are going to go be there with your friends. Um, and, you know, men, friends are uh, meant to... Um, be there to grieve with you and to comfort you just as much as they is to smile and laugh with you. Um, and so one okay, last thing in the circus of communicators this morning. Um, before Pastor Greg comes up to teach the word, my name is Darius. I'm one of the pastors here at Mount Rainier Christian Center. When I was um, really quick, when I was 17 years old, 16 years old, uh, when God really got a hold of my life as a young person, um, I, my eyes were just blown wide open. And I, I, for the first time in my life, I remember I was in high school, I remember seeing and believing, like, God wants to move in my generation. And uh, we started a ministry on our campus uh, that, that my senior year of high school. And we just began to see my peers come to this l lunchroom, uh, classroom during lunch, and give their lives to Jesus. And... Um, about 15 years has passed since then, and I uh, did youth ministry for 10 years. Now I'm 31. I turned 32 this year. Uh, I still look very young. Yeah. I don't know why that's so funny. Anyway, um, the only, there are a lot of things that have changed. The thing that has not changed is I still want to see revival in my generation. I still want to see God move in my peers. I still want to see people who are my, a lot of people, I don't have kids yet. A lot of my peers have kids. A lot of my peers are actually still single. A lot of my peers are still trying to figure out what a healthy relationship looks like. I don't care what stage of life you're in. Um, I, I want to see people around my age encounter Jesus in a powerful way. Tonight at 6 p.m., uh, we have a new thing that we're starting. It's called Encounter. We're going to have dinner here tonight. We will have kid care. Uh, if you've got kids, bring your kids out we'll give them food we'll put them in the room back there they'll hang out we'll have dinner together we'll worship a little bit together we'll encounter the presence of the living god because i honestly church i just believe that if we would encounter the presence of the living god together that something powerful would happen god would break out i, I was watching this this movie on friday night with some of the worship team with pastor weston and there's a scene that made me cry, and all these hippies in the 60s are getting saved. There's a video footage of all these hippies at the beach getting saved. They turned from drugs and gave their life to a better drug. His name is Jesus. And I was overwhelmed, and I said, God, when is that going to happen in my generation? Uh, if you want to see that happen in a younger generation, I don't care what age you are. Uh, if you feel young, come out. If you don't feel young, Come pray for us. Uh, but I believe that God wants to move. We'll be here at 6 p.m. We'll be here every week. We have child care once a month for the time being. And I'm just excited about what God's going to do. Go ahead and get your Bible out with that being said. And Pastor Greg, thank you. Thanks, Pastor Darius. And thanks to Josh. And gosh, um, to all the parents who are celebrating graduating seniors this morning, do you remember what it felt like when you weren't sure you were going to make it here? <laughs> you made it. You made it. You raised them. And now today is a day for you to celebrate. This, this time is a time for you to celebrate. Can we just congratulate all the families who've raised kids and seen them? Probably like you, I remember times when Rhonda and I looked at each other and said, I don't know if we're going to make it. And, and we're big wimps. We only had one. 
I think of my brother and his wife. They had seven. He's supposed to get out of the asylum pretty soon here. <laughs> It'll be cool to be with him again. But uh, no, that, that's a huge accomplishment and a big moment and a big milestone. And so we just, we celebrate with you. Congratulations uh, to you. And um, you should be deeply satisfied and deeply proud uh, of raising your kids. Big deal, big deal. Um, uh, before we open God's word this morning, we're almost done with Romans. We're just right in the end here. We're going to be in chapter 15 of, of Romans. We've been there in Romans ever since January, and here we are kind of winding it up. But before we jump into that, I, I just want to personally thank so many of us who, uh, who took the time to encourage Ron and I, to encourage me personally, after sharing last week about the sabbatical that I'm going to be on in July and August, so many of you came forward and just offered your blessings and your encouragement and your grace and, and all of that. And I'm just hugely thankful for that. The closer it gets, the more nervous I am about being away from my wife for two months because I'm a big weenie. But uh, your encouragement uh, means a lot. So huge thanks. And And to all of you who pointed out that I'm going to be on a bicycle on a highway full of RVs driven by elderly people, thank you for your blessing, too. I really, really appreciate that. Um, But no, it's going to be good. It's going to be great. And and I just want to thank you for that encouragement. Romans chapter 15. And remember, we have, we said to ourselves that it is important as we grow up in our faith that we begin to allow God to speak to us on his terms, that we receive his word in its context as it is. And that's why we take time every year to walk through whole books of the Bible, 16 chapters in Romans. We've been in this a long time. But as we grow up in our faith, we understand that we want to let our Father speak to us about things we don't even know we need to know about yet. We don't even know we need to ask about yet. And that's the mark that you're growing up in your faith, when God's word becomes an end in itself for you. Uh, And so we've been on this journey through Romans this morning. We're in chapter 15, beginning with verse 14, almost at the end. And, And let me begin by asking you this. Have you ever had what you'd call a dirty job? Now, when I say dirty job, you know what I'm talking about. You remember Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe and what a popular show that was and all the crazy stuff that we saw him investigate. By the way, I was encouraged this week as I was preparing. They're making a new season of Dirty Jobs right now. It's coming back, which is pretty cool. Um, great show. But it talked about all the, all the dirty jobs that need to be done in our world that we are blessed by and all the people who do them. And uh, Mike was asked in an interview that I came across if there was one dirty job that really just got to him, because we see him in so many situations. He said, was there one that, that just, you know, really curled your inside? And he said, actually, yeah. He says, it was the episode that I did about being an artificial cow inseminator. Do you know about this, right? So there's like this giant plastic glove, and you put it on, and you go to dairy ranches or cattle ranches, And then you do a thing I just don't want to talk about this morning, (laughs) and you do it over and over and over again. If if you're a little slow, it involves putting your hand way into somewhere and doing a thing. So, (laughs) yuck, you know. But we love that show. We love Dirty Jobs because really behind it is this kind of respect for the people who do that work, you know. I mean, part of it is you and I say, I'm glad I don't have that job, but part of it is also... You know, the the huge respect for the people who do it. This morning, I don't want to talk about a dirty job. I want to talk about its opposite. God wants to talk about those jobs that actually elevate us when we do them. You know, there are dirty jobs, and then there's the opposite. There's the ones that, that when we do them, they make of us more than we were. And we know it. We feel it. We experience it as we do those jobs. I think of a lady that I knew in another church that we pastored many years ago, and her name was Mary. She was a registered nurse. And from the time she left college until I knew her in her 60s, in that entire time, she had done an incredibly significant and important job, a ministry. She was a hospice nurse. 48 years of being a hospice nurse nurse. Wow. And you could just tell when you talked to her how much that had elevated her, how much that had made her more than I was, more than most of us are. 
There are jobs that elevate us. There are jobs that lift us, that make of us more than we are. Michael Platt tells the story of an Air Canada flight in October of 2012 that was filled with people going on vacation in Australia. But as they got close to the end of their journey, as they neared Australia, the pilot came on over the intercom and said to all the passengers, hey, uh, we have been contacted by the Australian Coast Guard. And as it turns out, our flight path is carrying us right over a section of ocean where there's a man lost at sea. His boat sank. He's alone in the water. And the Coast Guard is trying to find him. Our flight path happens to go right over the search area. So we're actually going to descend to a low altitude, drop our airspeed. We're going to be late getting to where we're going. But we need everyone to look out the window and see if you can spot this man to help the Coast Guard try and locate this shipwrecked man. Michael Platt writes, in that moment, all of us were transformed. Every person in that cabin. We had got on with coming from all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different jobs, all kinds of different cultures, young, old families, maybe husbands and wives squabbling, maybe people stressed by all kinds of stuff. But he said, when that announcement came in and the plane began to go down and the pilot asked us to help, the whole place changed. Suddenly, everybody was for everybody else. All of us were trying to get to a window so we could see out. Everybody was doing whatever it took to get the maximum number of eyeballs on the windows. And the plane descended to a low altitude. Mike said there was kind of a, a sense of hopelessness in the air because looking for one man in the Pacific Ocean is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But at the same time, we knew that we had to try. And then after... A number of minutes, there was one passenger who actually had, by providence, brought on board in his carry-on a pair of binoculars, and he shouted from his window that he had spotted 44-year-old Glenn I floating in the ocean. We screamed, we whooped, we hollered. The plane lowered, circled, waggled the wings to let him know that he'd been seen, to give the pilot time to pin down the location and radio it to the Coast Guard. Coast Guard came and saved his life. And Mike writes, we went on from that moment. The most satisfied, happy, <laughs> connected people that I've ever been around. Because in that moment, we suddenly all knew and understood. We felt why we were there. And it wasn't just to go on vacation. And it wasn't just to be comfortable in our seats. And it wasn't just to have the best possible experience by arriving on time and making our other connections. No, in that moment, all that we cared about was Glenn. And we knew that that was who we were, people looking for Glenn. And I share that story for this reason, friends, as we get to the end of Romans. That is what God is doing all the time. Seeking to save lost people. Jesus put it this way. He was unequivocal about it. The Lord said that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. When you and I were the lost, boy, those are precious words. But what Jesus is revealing in that moment is what he's about. And here's the big idea that the Apostle Paul's going to share that God wants us to grasp this morning as his people, that we will experience friendship with God when we join him in his mission to seek and to save. Jesus, on the night he went to the cross after spending those three years teaching his disciples, he said something to them in those last hours. It's profound, many things, but one thing for our purposes this morning. He said in John chapter 15, verse 15, these words, he said, catch this, I no longer call you servants. Why not? Because a servant doesn't 
know his master's business. That word know is rich in the original language. Feel, understand, share, know. A servant doesn't know his master's business, but, but now you do. You know that I have come to seek and to save the lost. So he said, instead, now I call you friends because everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. God is inviting you and me and everyone who's following Jesus. He is inviting us to experience friendship with him. And that happens when we join him in what matters most to him, which is looking out the window for those who don't know him yet. When we give ourselves to helping other people find their way to the God that we know, the one who loves us, who saves us, we discover friendship with God. And that's what's on the Apostle Paul's heart as he gets ready to finish this letter to the Romans. Romans 15, beginning with verse 14. Let's listen to what he says. Verse 14, Paul says, having explained the gospel, remember Romans is the gospel aid as he explained to a church that he never got to personally spend time with. He's writing to them the whole story, A to Z. As he gets to ready to close, he says this, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. What does he mean by that? And why is he saying that now? We'll see in just a moment. He says, I've written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That is to people who don't know God, to people who are lost, to people who are far from him. That's what Paul means when he says Gentiles. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty, priests build bridges, that's what the word means, the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles, the people who don't know him, might become an offering acceptable to God and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's take a minute to kind of digest this first part. And grasp this. First thing Paul says to the church, he says, I am confident that you are competent. I am confident that you are full of goodness. I'm confident that you have the abilities needed to, to experience life, friendship with God, mission with God. Now, understand that when he says that, it doesn't mean that the church at Rome is perfect. This is important to grasp. Because there are many other places in the New Testament, we don't have time to get into it this morning, we'll, we'll talk about the struggles the church was undergoing, the, 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 the conflicts within the church, the challenges from without the church, the, the spiritual immaturity that was there. Yeah, there was a, the church that he's writing to is not perfect, but he says it is competent. It is full of goodness, he says. The Greek word agasthune describes that which is a fundamentally good thing in the context of gatherings, of people gathered together. In other words, he says, I am confident that your fellowship together is a fundamentally good thing. My wife just got back from a week taking care of her mom. She had a big deal surgery. She's 78 years old. So Rhonda went down to Oregon to take care of her, be with her dad, help him out this whole week. It was a miserable week for me, all right? The whole time I was just thinking about myself and the fact that my wife wasn't there. But when she got back on Saturday, <sighs> wow. It is a fundamentally good thing for me to be around my wife. She makes me a better man, a better person. And that's the idea here. And it's important to grasp, friends, because Paul is saying to the church, hey, you're not perfect, but it is a fundamentally good thing when you come together. The effect that it has on you when you are gathered, when you repeatedly come together, that's a good thing. It has a profound power in your life. And he says, I'm confident of that, and, and it has a purpose. He's going to get to that in a moment. He also says, I believe that you're complete and competent, meaning that the, the main things you understand uh, and you grasp and you get. In other words, he's saying, church, I know you're not perfect, but what I want you to understand is that you are full of goodness and that you are competent for the mission of God. You know, sometimes we say to ourselves, well, one of the biggest things that gets between us and, and being involved in helping other people find God is that we say to ourselves, I don't have it together enough. I don't know enough. My life's not straightened out enough. 
Or, or sometimes we say that about ourselves as a church. We say, oh, we've got these problems and these challenges here. We're just not quite together enough to really be used of God. Paul says that's not the case. That's not the case. Even in our imperfections, even in your imperfections, there's competence. There's the ability to be involved in God's mission, to partner with him in finding lost people. You don't have to be perfect. Don't look in the mirror and say, I, I got to get it together before I can be part of this. No, all you got to do is hear the call and look out the window. Nobody on that airplane was a specially trained air sea rescue professional. Nobody. But everybody could go to a window or make space for somebody to go to a window so that they could together cover all the angles and look for Glenn. That's the idea here. And then Paul goes on, he places that idea in context by saying, because of the grace God has given me to be a minister to the Gentiles. In other words, he understands that the grace God has given him is meant to be shared. That the grace God has given you and given me, it's meant to be shared. It's meant to be given away. We're meant to look around and say, hey, who could I give this to? Who could I share this with? This good news of who God is, this message that he's seeking all lost people. Who can I share that with? Paul says, that's what grace does to me. Because God has forgiven me, I feel this desire to share his forgiveness. Let me ask us this morning. Do you think of your life as a mission to, to partner with God in finding lost people. That's what he wants you to discover. That's where friendship with him is experienced. That's where friendship with him is realized, where you encounter it. It's not just more Bible study. It's not just more worship. It's not just more prayer. All those things are important and real, but they're meant to bring us to the point where we join him in sharing this good news. Do you think of your life as a mission? The forgiveness and love of God are compelling things. That's why it's so important that we receive them. That's why it's so important that we receive God's grace so that we can stop obsessing over ourselves and look out the window. What, what would you think if you had been in that moment on that Air Canada flight and, and everybody's doing the best they can to look out the window and you notice some guy sitting over there playing video games, ignoring the window, you'd think, oh man, something's wrong here. This guy doesn't get this moment. He doesn't realize what's happening here. And Paul says, hey, when, when I received God's grace, it compelled me to go to the window. And notice what he says. He's, made, he's called me to be a minister to the Gentiles. When the Apostle Paul uses that phrase in his frame of reference, he's talking about all the people that are outside of his circle. He's talking about people from a different culture. He's talking about people with different politics. He's talking about people with different economics. He's talking about people that don't share all of his values. He's talking about Gentiles, people that don't know God and they're outside of the circle. And he says, what grace has done is made me interested in them. Why? Because I'm safe in the airplane. But Glenn's not. Glenn's outside the airplane. Glenn's on the edge of drowning so Paul says, I feel compelled by the grace I've been given, by my safety, to look, to seek, to search along with the God who's looking for Glenn. Three years ago, Steve Sanders was diagnosed with a, a rare genetic disease that was killing his kidneys. He had no idea he was predisposed to such a thing as a young father. He was diagnosed with this kidney failure, and it was so severe that after consulting with his doctor, he came to understand that he was going to need a kidney transplant. Now, when he discovered that, he did what any of us would do in that situation, worked with his doctor and started looking for a family member or a close friend who was a, a genetic match for a kidney transplant. And, and there was no shortage of family members and a few friends who were willing to say, hey, I'll, bro, I'll give you a kidney, you know, I'll donate one of mine, but... In a very unusual circumstance, they couldn't find anyone who was a match. No one in his family and no one among his friends. Steve says that, you know, he began to become a bit despondent about that. And uh, on a Saturday night, as he was kind of reflecting with the reality that if they didn't find a donor, you know, his life was going to be much shorter than he hoped. 
That night, he just posted on social media about his feelings and said, you know, I don't like thinking about the fact that I won't get to be a dad and to raise my kids the way that I want to and to teach them the things that are important. And he was just sharing his heart. All the way across the country, later that night, a complete stranger named Chris Perez just happened to come across Steve's post. And he came across it in a moment when he was thinking about with young kids, the challenge of being a good dad. And Steve's post touched him and he wondered, is it possible that maybe I could be a match? And so he got in touch with Steve and they began a process. And in July of 2021, these complete strangers met outside of, of Steve's doctor's office and went inside and found out that in fact they were a match. And in January of 2022, successful surgery happened, and Chris, Steve got one of Chris's kidneys. And they said, we immediately bonded because we both wanted to be the best dads that we possibly could for our kids. We both came from troubled situations without great fathering, and we wanted to be sure that we gave great fathering. And he said, once we realized that, that about each other, we bonded so deeply. Chris writes, it made being a dad even more important to both of us. You see, friendship grows out of a shared mission. He says, now Steve and I are bonded together forever. We talk weekly. We talk about the challenges of parenting. We're kind of one another's advocates through this journey of being dads. Yeah, why? Because friendship grows out of a shared sense of mission. And that's what God is saying to me and you. The Apostle Paul says that's what happened to him because of the grace of God. He received this call to the Gentiles. And it's an ironic moment because he had made his whole life about God and then found out that he was fighting against God. Paul had that encounter in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, the most religious of men. Jesus confronted him and said, you're actually fighting against God. You're actually resisting me. Why? Because you're not seeking the Gentiles. Your heart is not for the lost people. Paul was completely transformed by that moment. And God invites us to experience that as well. Friends, just the big idea this morning is simply this. When you understand that God's heart is to save lost people. And you join him in that, in whatever ways you can, you will begin to experience friendship with him. We talk here at MRCC about how you grow up in your Christian faith. You first know God as Savior, and then as you grow, you begin to know him as Lord, as he teaches you his ways, takes authority in your life, leads you in good ways. Then, then you begin to know him as Father, and that's a beautiful, profound, emotional, spiritual thing to, to truly walk with God as Father. But that's not the end of the journey. The ultimate goal of the journey is that we would know him as friend, as the person that we walk alongside, caring about what he cares about, experiencing friendship with God. That happens when we share his mission. To put this another way, the Apostle Paul was captured by his friendship with God. Have you ever been captured by friendship? I remember when I was in high school, my buddy, a guy that wasn't my buddy, but we became buddies, was a big tennis star. He was all about tennis. And so he used me as his practice dummy. He would drag me out again and again and again and just have somebody to hit balls at, you know. And I wasn't about tennis or anything, but the more I hung out with Don and the more that I was his practice dummy, what grew into me was kind of a love for tennis. Hey, this is fun. I'm kind of into this. He crushed me every time, but I was getting into it. You know, I was getting... Out of our friendship grew a love. And that's what God wants for us. Over in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells us what God loves. Jesus told a story. It's about a shepherd and his sheep. And very briefly, here's how it goes. The Bible says the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear him. That's interesting. He lived the kind of life that lost people wanted to connect with. Wow, I'm, I'm endlessly challenged by that. It's my prayer that I live the kind of life that people who don't know God are attracted to. The Bible says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Today they'd say, he's woke. We got no time for that. 
Then Jesus told them a parable. They said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. He's talking to people who know shepherding. He says, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country? Why? Because they're safe, they're fenced, they're in a good place. And go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then, notice this, he calls his friends and his neighbors together. And he says, rejoice with me. Why them? Because they get it. Because they understand. Because they're connected to him. God wants that kind of connection for you and me. That kind of connection where he can call us together to celebrate with him. And he says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. And then Jesus winds it up. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, changes her mind, than over 99 righteous people who don't need to. That's a mouthful. You know, God digs what we're doing here. God digs this time we're having together, this fellowship, this shared sense of who God is and his love and family. He digs this so much, but even more. He digs that moment when someone who doesn't know him, when someone who's bobbing in the sea and drowning is only a matter of time, he loves seeing them rescued even more. And, and friends, when we know this, when we share this, we will know what it is like to have friendship with God. If that's something that your heart hungers for, know this. Here's where it's found. In seeking and saving the lost. The Pharisees, they thought they were fighting a culture war about who's right and who's wrong. Jesus said God's more interested in who's lost and who isn't. The Christian faith is much less defined by what we're against than who we're for. And Jesus wants us to understand that. The Lord makes it so plain. Over in Matthew chapter 9, he put it this way. He said, hey, Greg, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. <laughs> Duh. Every time I read that, I think, you make a good point. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. And then quoting the prophet Hosea, Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Wow. There's tremendous irony in this moment because he, he says that to Pharisees who, who, who were so convinced that big righteousness is found in pushing out of your life all those people who don't know God. Jesus said, no, it's exactly the opposite. It's when you bring him in that the biggest righteousness is found. And that word righteousness is so rich, it means relationship with God, intimate relationship with God. Friendship is found when we look out the window with him. When we're willing to do that, when we understand his heart for them. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Apostle Paul gets this. And so listen to what he says. We're almost done. He says, therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything. In other words, here's the most important thing in my life. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I say and by what I do. Another thing, he says, one thing is more important to me than everything else in life. And that's looking out the window. That's scanning the ocean for Glenn. For that shipwrecked, lost guy. As we get ready to close this morning, let me just ask you, are you looking out the window? At work? In your school? In your neighborhood? In your community? Wherever you are? Are, are your eyes out the window? God's are. God's are. That's what he's looking for. All those drowning, lost people who don't know him, who don't know his love, his grace, who don't know that he wants them. He's looking for them all the time. He says, hey, I call you friends when you join me in that, when you share that with me. So how do we do that in our last five minutes? Let me give you a few quick practical things. We'll be out of here. If you're taking notes, write these down. Number one is to understand his heart. It's what we've been talking about all morning. To just know his heart. This is God's heart. Understand that he's, and he's after your Gentiles. The people that are different from you. The people that are outside of your circle. The people who don't agree with you now. 
the people who even disagree with you now. His heart is for them. He wants to seek and save, not the unlost, but the lost. Jesus says, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, Greg. He said, you want to be my friend? The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, I was so blessed by someone who came up to me when I shared about my sabbatical last week. And they said, Pastor Greg, I just want to tell you, when you're out there on the highway, you're going to bump into people that God wants you to bump into. And he wants you to know that he's going to be with you in those moments and that that's part of the reason why you're there. It's like, yes, you're right. I'm looking for those moments. I'm looking for those moments. So understand his heart. The second thing, aim for some street cred. Aren't I hip when I say that? Aim for some street cred. In other words, live, live a life that gains the credibility so that you can be heard, so that people want to hear you. You know, it's a profound thing to realize that our Lord most righteous man who ever lived. People who were unrighteous wanted to hear him. They, they gathered to hear, oh, this guy's got something to say. I want to live the kind of life that, that those people who don't know him say, well, I, I want to hear what he has to say. P Paul writes it this way. He says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Wow, how counterculture is that? Uh, in worldly wisdom, we say, teach slaves to revolt so they can get their freedom. God doesn't say that. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything. Catch this. To try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. When you're looking out the window, you're living your life in a way that says, hey, I, I want people to believe in what I have to say. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, let your daily life win the respect of outsiders. That's what it means to look out the window. So aim for some street cred. The third thing is to practice with the team regularly. The Bible says, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus teaches us that our ongoing life together is the best music for our message. And this is really important to grasp. Jesus' prayer on the night he went to the cross was that we would be united because he said that's the key to people believing the gospel. Ron and I have been deeply blessed and graced and privileged for all 35 years of ministry because we've, we've been able to, to be parts of churches that were growing every time. And, and people will say, what's your strategy? What's your plan? What do you do to make that happen? Are you kidding? I am not that smart. Here's what I do know because Jesus told me. That if I will teach people to love one another, and if I will relentlessly teach us how to do that, Jesus says through that, people will be drawn to God. Over and over and over again in our membership classes, people tell me, why, why did you decide to come to wherever church? Why did you decide to come? Oh, because, man, people just seem to like each other. <laughs> people just seem to get along. It's a cool feeling. It's friendly. Yeah, yeah, wow. It's, it's not magic. It's supernatural. But it happens when we love one another. See, this whole... Mission is a team mission. Think of all the people on the plane. If only one person's looking out the window, but if everybody's looking out the window, you've got a 360 perspective on the ocean, Glenn's going to get found. So, so practice with the team. The fourth thing, we're almost done. Get in the game. Paul says, I become all things to all men so that by all possible means I, I might save some. Here's our very simple kind of philosophy of, of how to look out the window, how to join God in his mission. It's really simple, friends. God is calling you and me to, to do what we already love to do. Bowling, turkey hunting, you name it. But to do it with unchurched people. That's the key. We say, no, I just want to gather around the non-Gentiles, my people. We'll get together and do our thing. God says, no, no, no. If you will do what you love to do with unchurched people, then my Holy Spirit will go to work in that. And you'll be part of my seeking and saving. One day you'll plant a seed. Another day you'll water a seed. Some days you'll harvest a seed, 1 Corinthians 3. And people will become believers. So let me challenge you. Do you have any unchurched friends that you're doing life with? Jesus did the entire time. Uh, uh, entirety of his life. He was surrounded by unchurched people so that God could work through him to draw them. And then the last thing is to get grace for your own sins. And that's really a simple thing. Just receive it. 
Remember what Paul said to the church at Rome? You're not perfect, but you're good enough. That's pretty much the testimony of your life and mine. <laughs> you're not perfect, but you're good enough for God to use you. Just believe that. Just say, God, I receive your grace today. Here I am again. Here I am again. <laughs> Believing that your grace is sufficient, that you can use me in my imperfections. In 2004, closing story. A man named Chen Shi from Nanking in China discovered his life's mission. In his city, Nanking in China, there's a bridge which has sadly, tragically, become a magnet for people who want to commit suicide. In fact, since 1968, this bridge in Nanking has seen more than 1,100 people jump to their death. It's become known throughout China as the place to go if you want to kill yourself. People fly from around the country to jump off this bridge and commit suicide. Mr. Shi, after surviving his own ordeal with depression, became aware of this because the bridge happened to be on his way to work. He foot commutes and he crosses that bridge. And he said that he decided to appoint himself guardian of the bridge. So after work and on weekends and during his foot commutes, he decided that his, his job was to watch for the people who were going to jump. He said, you know, it's, it's, it's not really hard to identify them. In his words, he said, you can tell who they are because they walk like people with no spirit. He approaches them. He talks to them. Sometimes he grabs on and clings to them while he talks to them. And do you know that in 18 years since he started doing this, he has been responsible for saving 48 people from committing suicide. 48 people. If you got to the end of your life and you're choking out your last in a nursing home somewhere and you know that you prevented 48 suicides, you'll die with a smile on your face. God says, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm about. That's, that's, that's what I'm all about. He says, Greg, if you want to know friendship with me, join me. Join me. Be a part of this. Look out the window. Keep your eyes out the window. And I'll meet you in it. 48 people. Mr. Shi says, even if it's only one, it's enough. So he continues to walk the bridge, watching for people with no spirit. It's what God does. It's what he invites us to do. Would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes and bow your head? First thing you want to know this morning, if you feel like jumping off the bridge, God is seeking you. He wants to rescue you. And in this moment, you can receive him as your savior, your father. All you do is reach out. He knows your heart. He can hear your thoughts. You say, God, I need you to be my savior. I need to know you as my friend. You can do that right here and right now in this moment. He's listening to you. Just tell him. His Holy Spirit will rush into you in the moment that you do. But maybe, maybe you're just someone who's trying to stay comfortable in your seat, arrive on time, get to vacation. God says, hey, will you look out the window with me? Because what you're really hungry for is friendship with me and you'll find it looking out the window. Maybe you need to make the choice to do that today. Go ahead. Jesus is inviting you. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. God, send us out into the world looking out the window, we pray. Looking for those people that you're seeking. We ask that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, friends? Oh, my goodness. That parking lot's going to be insane. I'm sorry. I went long. I apologize. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a great afternoon. Mm.